We appreciate you taking time out of your busy day. I know that it's busy holidays and everybody's trying to get their projects done before the end of the year. I do want to comment and thank our team at AWC. We have quite a team that puts on these webinars. It's just not a few people. Um, it's, we have staff on AWC that help with assisting that. More specifically, we have Marcy Weber, Suzanne Termat, Lori Cook, Brian Knight, Buddy Showalter, and Phil Line, all helping to support this webinar. So thank everyone, thank you for joining us, and thanks for all the help. <clears throat> Now, as Marcy mentioned, we are going to be talking about calculating per allowable stress design shear wall capacities per 2015 wind and seismic provision. This presentation is copyrighted by the American Wood Council. If you'd like to use any portion of the presentation, please contact us and we'll help uh, assist with presentation. And this presentation is also copy, uh, registered with AIA as well as NCSEA and ICC for continuing education credit. We've provided a description in the presentation and hopefully all of you have had a chance to download the PDF of the presentation. I know Brian and some of our other staff are probably putting in the chat box a uh, link to where you can get a download of the presentation if you haven't already done so. The learning objectives today, we are going to talk about, uh, be able to, uh, after participating in this webinar, you'll be able to understand the 2015 wind and seismic provisions for distributing the shear to shear walls in a line. And we'll also look at understanding or becoming familiar with the provisions related to shear distribution based on either the deflection calculation approach or using the reduced strength, shear strength approach. And we'll, this is a bulk of what the presentation is about. And then we'll also be able to understand how distribution of shear provisions affect design shear capacities of shear walls in a line. And then we'll also become familiar with new strength reductions for shear walls based on shear wall aspect ratio, something that's new to the wind and seismic provisions. Now, we'll start off with our first poll, and remember, the polls throughout the presentation do not, uh, are, do not count towards your continuing education credit. So, Marcy, you want to launch the first poll? I'm not hearing Marcy. I must have muted myself instead of um, unmuting, sorry. <laughs> um, this one's the easiest one. So architect, engineer, code official, building designer, or other. Um, and we already have 84% voted, so I'm going to go ahead and close since we have a lot to get through today. So let's see. We have 81% engineers, 12% code official. Um, 3% architect, 2% other, and 1% building designers. So um, we are happy to see everyone that's here. So welcome. That's great. I'm going to turn it back to you, there Michelle. Is no, there is no incorrect answer for that question. OK. Now, just an outline of the presentation, what we'll look at is first the code acceptance for the wind and seismic provisions. And by the way, throughout the presentation, instead of saying the long title of the, public, of the standard, Special Design Provisions for Wind and Seismic, I'll be referring to it as Wind and Seismic Provisions. And so we'll look at the code acceptance. We'll also look at the distribution of shear provisions to shear walls in a line. And there is the deflection calculation approach and then alternative approach of adjustment factor approach. And then we'll look at aspect ratio factor, dealing with strength. The previous one dealt with the stiffness of the deflection compatibility of the shear walls and the Sec the third bullet item deals with the aspect ratio, dealing with the strength. And then, more importantly, with all of this is the design examples that we'll go through. So you become, will become familiar with the process of determining what 
how the shear is distributed to the shear walls based on the stiffness of the walls and also the impacts of the aspect ratio factor. So next slide dealing with the code acceptance. Where does the code state that the wind and seismic provision is a reference standard? And this presentation is based on the 2000 15 IBC, so the model code that we're basing this on. And it references the wind and seismic provisions in section 2305 of chapter 23 of the code. <clears throat> All the, pre the previous editions, just some background on that, in the 2012 and the 2009 both reference the 2008 wind and seismic provisions. And the what were the main emphasis of this presentation is about section 4.3.3.4.1. This section is in chapter 4, which is titled Lateral Force Resistance, Resisting Systems, and this part of the provision deals with in-plane shear. So we're talking about in-plane shear diaphragms or in-plane shear shear wall. In this presentation, we're talking about shear walls only, though. And the section that we're specifically talking about is 4.3.3.4.1, which states that shear distribution to individual shear walls in a line or shear wall line provides, shall provide the same calculated deflection in each wall. Now, this concept is not new. It's been in previous editions of the wind and seismic provision. However, what is new is the overall organization of the requirements. That is what's new, and we'll go over the overall organization. But for a simplification of this approach, when we're talking about distributing the shear to shear walls all in one line, uh, the approach that we're going to look at will, will be based on the stiffness of the walls. And that's going to be, we'll uh, simplify it by stating that's the deflection calculation approach. And um, so the layout of the requirements, uh, what we've done is taken these requirements and put it in as general requirements which it, within section 4.3.3. And they are now general provisions for distributing the load based on stiffness of the wall. <clears throat> and then as an alternative method to determining it based on the deflection calculation approach is this adjustment factor approach, which is uh, based on the 2B over H. This is something that has been used in the past, was in the previous provisions, and distribution of the shear, which is based on a reduced shear strength determined by this familiar method of 2B over H. <clears throat> now, some background on this is this adjustment factor, or adjustment factor approach, has been recognized in the building code for seismic, for wood structural panels since 2003 in the IBC and in uh, the wind and seismic provisions in 2001. And it continues in the 2015 wind and seismic provision. So looking back and looking at uh, giving you some background on what it, where it was in the 2008 wind and seismic provision, you will see that you probably looks very familiar. On the left we have the table 4.3.4 that has aspect ratios and then some footnotes for the 2008 wind and seismic provisions. In the 2015, those footnotes are no longer there and we've moved that within the body of the provisions. You can see that the aspect ratios have not changed from one table to the other. We've just migrated this information to make it more uh, organized within our standard and um, we'll go over that in more detail in the next few slides. But the other thing that I want to point out is these provisions are also now for both wind and seismic. Previously, related to the adjustment factor footnote, we, it was only for seismic. And um, just a side note here also, for structural fiberboard, that was for wind, but now, these are all for both wind and seismic. So looking at this in more detail, drilling down a little deeper on where things have migrated to and the footnotes, here's the 2008 
the same table that was on the previous slide, and you see this footnote one. This is what we're familiar with in adjusting the the capacities of the Shearall based on this 2B over H. Now that is migrated into the exception for determining the capacity of the shear walls based on the stiffness of the shear wall. And as you recall, we talked about the deflection calculation approach. So that's the general provision, deflection calculation approach on distributing the shear to the shear walls in a line. As an alternative to that, we have the exception of the familiar 2B over H. Now, in addition to that, we also see that footnote 3 has been migrated to 4.3.4.2. 4.3.4.2 is a reduction in the strength of the shear wall at, based on the aspect ratio. So we'll dive down deeper into this and look at what the differences in are between these reductions. In um, the deflection calculation approach, we look at the shear wall in a line, which is shown here. We have two shear walls, and this is the exact configuration that we're going to use for our design example. We have an aspect ratio of 1 to 1 for shear wall 1, 8 feet high and 8 feet long. And then for the second shear wall, we have an aspect ratio of 3.5, which is 8 feet high and 2.3 long. And to account, we know that um, the wall on the left, shear wall 1, is going to be stiffer than the wall on the right because of, of just the overall length and height, it's going to be stiffer. So the load needs to be distributed to these shear walls based on the stiffness of the wall. So we need to account for that in our distribution. And to, to determine this, uh, we're going to use the deflection three-term equation from the wind and seismic provisions, which is in section 4.3.2, equation 4.3-2. Uh, the three-term equation is shown here. Um, some of you may be familiar with the four-term equation, and that's still included in the wind and seismic provision, but that's in the commentary. We're using now, in this uh, this actual example and this presentation, the three-term equation. The first term of the equation accounts for the bending in the shear wall. So we have V, which is the induced shear, H is the height of the wall, E is your modulus of elasticity of your end post, A is your area of your end post, and B is the length of the shear wall. The third term, the middle term, has the induced shear, the height, and your, excuse me, your apparent shear wall stiffness. Now what's great about the three-term equation is the apparent shear wall stiffness is that now it not only applies to which structural panel, but it also applies to other shear wall types. And then the third part of the equation has to do with our wall anchorage slip our elongation and uh, vertical elongation of our wall anchorage system. So that includes the fastener slip, device elongation, rod, if you're using rod, tie down rods, the rod elongation. Um, and that's at the induced uh, unit shear of the shear wall. So this describes the three term equation that we're using. And looking at drilling down deeper, to the exception, if we didn't want to go use the deflection calculation approach, we can use the adjusted factor approach. And that's based on our familiar 2B over H. Now for wood structural panels, the 2B over H would apply. And what triggers this adjustment factor is when our aspect ratio of our shear walls is greater than 2 to 1. So anything greater than 2 to 1 will trigger this adjustment uh, factor. If you're at 2 to 1 then and less, then you don't need to use this adjustment factor. It would just be 1. So this accounts for the stiffness for high aspect ratio shear walls and allows us to do an alternate approach by reducing the strength of our shear wall. Um, one thing to point out is, again, this is for both wind and seismic. Um, which is different than what it was in the 2008. 
The other thing to remember is that this aspect ratio uh, adjustment, or I'm sorry, this adjustment factor based on stiffness is not cumulative with our aspect ratio factor for strength. And I'll explain that. And that's in the next few slides that will be explained a little bit deeper. So let me back up and explain this. We have the deflection calculation approach. As an alternative to the deflection of calculation approach, we have the adjustment of factor approach, which is not cumulative to the aspect ratio approach. <clears throat> and this is the aspect ratio factor, which they found through testing that the strength of shear walls is reduced based on high aspect ratios, and that is introduced here in 4.3.4.2. And if we look at this, we would say this is one based on wood structural panels for uh, accounting for those high aspect ratios when we're getting over the 2 to 1 aspect ratio using this equation for wood structural panel, 1.25 minus 0.125 H over B. And for structural fiberboard, there's a different uh, calculation for that or a different equation. So we look at the, what the results are when we look at reducing the aspect ratio of st for strength is shown here, and this is a really good summary to show you the difference between the aspect ratios. So for a 2 to 1, we have a 1.0 aspect ratio. For 3 to 1, we have a 0.875 as, uh, reduction aspect ratio factor. And then all the way up to 3 and a half to 1, we can exceed, th cannot exceed 3 and a half to 1, but we are reducing our capacity of our shear wall by a roughly about 19%. And this applies to both segmented and forced transfer around shear walls. Perforated shear wall has their own adjustment factor. Uh, but for this presentation, we're only talking about segmented shear walls. And it also applies to the wind and resisting wind and seismic. The other thing to remember is this is not cumulative with if we're doing the alternate approach. So to clarify this, looking at the two adjustment factors, we have the one for, if we're not using the deflection calculation approach, we go to the adjustment factor stiffness approach. And then figure out what the adjustment is based on 2B over H. Then we look at the strength ba reduction based on our aspect ratio. And as you can see, for high aspect ratios and the reduction is quite big relative to when we're doing the uh, def distributing the shear to the shear walls in a line. And the other thing to remember is these two adjustments are not cumulative. So the adjustment factor is not cumulative with the aspect ratio approach. And so I think we now have a poll. And Marcy, I'd like to bring you back. Here we go. So, everybody see it? Which is true with respect to the 2B sub S over H adjustment factor approach for WSP in the SPIDWIZ 4.3.3.4.1. Is that the 2B sub S over H factor applies where H over B sub S is greater than 2 to 1? or not cumulative with aspect ratio factor for strength in 4.3.4.2, or applies only to seismic design, D, all of the above, or answers A and B only. Are we getting a lot of answers? 
something. Marcy? Michelle, I'm not sure what happened. I was going to say, I'm going to go ahead and close the poll because there were 80% that had already voted. Okay. <laughs> well, they did the answer right? The answer is, you, did you close it? Okay. Can you see the answers? It's 78% answered A and B only. So that was the most popular oh. answer. Oh, awesome. That's great. And that is the answer, A and B only. So one thing I want to point out is, and I want to go back to the previous slide because that shows, um, that's true that the aspect ratio is, let me go to that, the, uh, it applies only for where we have two, uh, aspect ratio greater than two to one, and also that it's not cumulative with the aspect ratio factor. And it does apply to both wind and seismic. So great that most of you got that correct. The one thing I also want to point out is that there was a, a common misunderstanding about the 2B over H, which was formally under the footnote in Table 4.3.4. Um, and that is that the it was and misunderstood that it represented an actual reduction in the unit shear capacity for high aspect ratio shear walls. But the actual strength reduction associated with high aspect ratio shear walls is less severe, as we're shown here. We have the aspect ratios based on the um, whether or not uh, they're greater than 2 to 1. And you can see this reduction is less than what we have for the stiffness. So that's one thing I wanted to point out there. And then I'll move on to the next slides. Okay, now we're going to dive into the actual design example, something I'm sure you will all appreciate. And this is our, our shear wall. It just, we'll just assume that we have a blocked wood structural panel. And the thickness of the panel is 15 32nd which, and the wood structural panel is OSB. That will give us our apparent shear stiffness. And then we have 2 by 10 Douglas fir framing. We're using 8 penny or galvanized box, I mean 8 penny common or galvanized box nails at 6 inches on center edge nailing, edge spacing. And then from our uh, table, we have a capacity of seismic nominal shear, unit shear capacity of 200, 520 pounds per linear foot. From the same table, we'll get the apparent shear stiffness, knowing that it's OSB. And then our end posts, we have double 2x4s with an EA, a modulus of elasticity times the area, of 16,800,000 uh, and then pounds. And then our vertical elongation of our wall anchorage system, we're assuming that it's 350 pounds at an eighth of an inch. Now, what, a little bit of background about that is the 350 pounds is assumed to be the allowable stress capacity, allowable stress design capacity of the hold down with an elongation of an eighth of an inch. Now, typically, you would get this information from the hold down manufacturer, whoever that may be. They would provide this information. And then for the stiffness of the actual anchorage of the system, we just use the K equals the 3,500 divided by the elongation to come up with 28,000 pound per inch. And looking back at where we come up with the actual capacities for the shear wall and the parent shear wall stiffness, we go to our wind and seismic provisions, which is in table 4.3a, shown here. And these are nominal unit shear capacities. And for wood structural panel, which we have 15 32nd using eight penny nails, we have a capacity of 520 pounds per linear foot, and then our parent shear stiffness of 13 kips per inch. Now, notice if we were using plywood, it would be 10 kips per inch. So that's why we included the OSB in our notes. So our 
configuration of our shear walls is that shear wall one has eight foot long and eight foot high. Then shear wall two is eight foot, a 2.3 long and eight foot high. And for those of you that haven't received your copy of the wind and seismic provision, this actual example is in the commentary of our publication. So if you want some more information, you can go to the commentary to get more information. <clears throat> okay, shear wall one is we've gotten, we've got the nominal shear capacity for seismic as 520 pounds per linear foot. We determine our aspect ratio is just our H over B, which is 8 over 8, which is 1.0. Now remember, we also have to adjust our strength based on the aspect ratio factor. So because our aspect ratio is 1, then our aspect ratio factor is 1.0. And it, it doesn't trigger it until we get over to to one. So we're good at 1.0 and so we adjust our unit shear capacity. Remember what we get from our table is 520 pounds per linear foot and that's a nominal unit shear capacity and then we've got to divide by two to get it into an allowable stress design. And then we multiply by our aspect ratio factor which is 1.0 coming up with a capacity of 263 pounds, I mean 260 pounds per linear foot. Now, now we get into shear wall two. This is a narrow shear wall, it's got a high aspect ratio, and we again have the same nailing for this shear wall. Both shear walls have same nailing, same wood structural panel, same framing, all constructed the same. And our capacity, nominal shear capacity is 520 pounds per linear foot. Our aspect ratio for this shear wall is 8 feet divided by 2.3. So that is 300, I mean 3.5 is our aspect ratio. Triggering in that aspect ratio factor for strength is 1.25 minus 0.125 times H over B. And that comes up to be 0.81. And throughout this process, I should have backed up and said that we're going to go through the deflection calculation approach. That's the first approach. That's the general approach. And I'm sorry I didn't mention it at the beginning, but it is mentioned at the top of the slide just the basic general approach of deflection calculation approach. But we still need to consider our aspect ratio factor when it relates to our strength of our shear walls. So because this is a high aspect ratio, or greater than 2 to 1, that triggers a 0.81 reduction in our strength. Now the allowable stress design for the unit shear of this shear wall is 520 pounds divided by two to get it into an allowable stress design and then reduce it to but times it times 0.81, a reduction of 19% and coming up with 210 pounds per linear foot. Whereas our longer shear wall with an aspect ratio of one to one was at 260, we've been reduced to 210 because of the high aspect ratio. Now, what do we do now? Now we need to determine based on, and at the top of, you can see that it's 260 here, 210 based on the high aspect ratio, um, the maximum shear for each wall. Now the next step is to understand how do we address this distribution of our shear based on the stiffness of the shear walls to both shear wall one and shear wall two. And because shear wall one, um, we recognize that the allowable stress unit shear capacity of shear wall one is associated with a smaller deflection. That makes sense. We have a, a longer wall, it's going to have a shorter deflection as opposed to our narrow wall. So the problem can be simplified by finding the reduced design unit shear in the less stiff wall, which is the shear wall two. And that produces this same deflection as shear wall one. So the idea is we have a stiff wall here, a less stiff wall here, 
but for deflection uh, compatibility and per the requirement, each of the shear walls need to have the same drift. So we'll use this as our baseline, find out what our deflection is for this shear wall on the left, and determine what our capacity is for this shear wall based on restricting, restricting the def deflection to the same deflection as the shear wall on the left. Okay, and so we'll go through the step-by-step -step approach. As mentioned previously, we are using the three-term equation, which is based on our bending in our a, a shear wall, our shear in our shear wall, based on shear, bending shear, and then the wall anchorage slip. So we know these are all given. We know what our capacity is of our shear wall, which is 260 pounds per linear foot. Our height is given as eight. E, A, that's a given, and then B is a given. We can determine this first term. We can determine the second term as well because we know our parent shear stiffness. We know our height, and we also know our um, shear for the shear wall, or capacity for the shear wall. So those two terms. And, and then we can also determine what our elongate our uh, anchorage slip is and we'll give you a little bit background behind that and how we determine the slip for our uh, that third term in the next few slides so the vertical elongation what we see is we assume that um, the vertical elongation of the wall or anchorage is assumed to vary linearly with the overturning anchorage force which can be calculated. And it can be calculated based on this, this 260 pounds per linear foot times the height, which comes up to be uh, 2,080. And the anchorage system stiffness is 3,500 divided by 0.125 gives you uh, an anchorage stiffness, system stiffness of 28,000 pounds. Now, understanding that, we can also come up with our drift for our shear wall one, that third term in the equation, by plugging that into the equation. But again, that was assuming that we uh, assume to very linearly that that elongation of our anchorage is varying linearly with the overturn anchorage force. And um, one thing to point out also is when we determined this, we did not include, we neglected any dead load to resist that overturning, and we also neglected any compression deformation of the framing, such as at the sill plate. So this is just purely on the anchorage, uh, the elongation of the anchorage. Certainly if you're doing a calculation on actual shear wall with actual forces, you would to con possibly you could consider the dead load, you would definitely want to consider the any compression deformation of the framing. So we plug that into the equation and looking at the three term equation, let me look back. This is where the 0 0.074 comes into play based on what we just discussed in the slide. So the total deflection for the first shear wall, shear wall one, is 0.242. And keep that in mind. Now we're going to use that to determine what our strength of the shorter shear wall is because we want to have equal deflection between the two walls. So now looking at uh, the, let me go back to this. Um, also what we want to do is determine the unit shear for the shear wall two that produces the same deflection, which is what I just said. And that turns is we can resolve that three-part equation. Let me go back to the three-part equation. What we want to do is solve for V because that's going to determine what the strength is to provide the equal deflection as our shear wall one. So we can revise this equation to solve for this V sub S for shear wall two. And that's what we've shown here. That's where it looks like kind of a strange equation, but that's what we did. We wanted to resolve it to solve for the strength of the shear wall two, knowing that we're, our target is the 0.242. And the result was 141 pounds per linear foot. And we'll come up with 
uh, we'll go through and how we came up with that. But this is what's important is the 141 pounds per linear foot is less than what we calculated previously. And let me go here, which was 210 pounds per linear foot. The other thing I want to note is, is this, that we're, our target is that, again, 0.242. We want to have equal deflection. So when we resolve this equation, we know that these are all given. This uh, part here for the bending, accounting for bending, and also accounting for shear. What very, what we also have to resolve for is the elongation of our hold down. Now looking at that a little deeper, how do we come up with that? How do we resolve for that equation? We'll explain the third term. And what's shown here is, this is your basic equation. We have the last equation, third part of the equation, that solves for the elongation of that contributes from the anchorage at the end of the wall. So what we want to do is solve this in terms of V, because that's our target, what we're looking for. What, what is applied to that to give us our ap applicable elongation. And by resolving this, we're going to do the induced shear times H over the stiffness, K. And plugging that into the equation, into this equation, we solve for A. We plug this into this equation and come up with H over 2 times V sub S W over KB. And that's how we substituted that in to get that third term equation. Looking back, you can see it right here in the denominator. That's how we came up with that. Okay. And uh, K is just the, as I mentioned, the stiffness of the anchorage. Now we plug that into the equation and we determine that the unit shear for the second shear wall is 140 pounds per linear foot. Um, the overturning anchorage force, now we're going to check to make sure that we come up with an equal deflection. So we take that unit shear, come up with our overturn anchorage force, which is 1,128 pounds, and then come up with our third term of the equation, dividing by 28,000 pounds, which is 0 .040. Again, once again, we neglect dead load and we neglect any deformation at the sill plate or in our framing. We plug that back into the equation, and we ha these are all given, this is all given, this has to do with the elongation of the rod, and remember we resolved here 0 0.041, we plug that into the equation coming up with 0.42, I mean 0.242. So plugging that all in, we, what we do is now verifying that our load of 100, well, our unit shear force of 141 pounds per linear foot does in fact produce a 0.242 deflection. And remember, that's the same deflection as our shear wall one. So now what we've done is distributed the load or distributed determine the capacity of the shear walls based on the distributing of the load to this based on the stiffness of the walls. And hopefully I'm not confusing you, but uh, they are equal. So what is the capacity of our shear wall now that we know there's different stiffnesses? We've adjusted it for the aspect ratio for the strength. We have our 260 pounds per linear foot times eight. That gives 2,000 and 80. And then based on the reduction of strength and based on the reduction for stiffness, we have 141 pounds per linear foot times 2.3. That gives us a 324 pound capacity for a total for that line of 2,404. So that's our capacity for those two shear walls. Now, had we not done the adjustment for the actual stiffness, it would come out to 2,563, just to let you know. So we need to accommodate that in our uh, calculation to make sure that the shear walls are distributing 
are, are deflecting the same. So here's a little graphic that we came up with that, um, and this is also in the commentary. On the horizontal axis, we have deflection. That's the drift of the shear wall. On the vertical axis, we have the load. So for the shear wall, that's one-to-one -one aspect ratio. We had a capacity of 2008. And then here, for the shorter wall, we have a capacity of 324 to provide that equal deflection in both of the walls. So we can have deflection compatibility along that line. Now, had we not done that, if we hadn't adjusted our capacities and we only adjusted it for the strength of the aspect ratio, we would be somewhere around here. And you can see, based on this graph, that our deflection would be over 0.35 inches. So that means that the compatibility of those two walls in that same line, that deflection compatibility will be different. And we don't want that. We want compatible deflection so they'll both move the same distance. OK, hopefully now we have a poll coming up in the next slide. I believe so. If it's not in your slide, it is for me. So, <laughs> um, let's see. Yeah. Did it go? I think so. Are you seeing it? Yep, I'm okay. seeing it. Are you hearing me? <laughs> yeah, I'm hearing you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So here we go. I'm going to launch. There we go. All right. Example one. That's what you had just seen. Um, illustrates which of the following for high aspect ratio shear walls. That, that it has lower strength than a low aspect ratio shear wall, that it has lower deflection than a low aspect ratio shear wall, anchorage slip may contribute consli considerably to wall deflection, all of the above, or A and C. So. And this all has to do with a high aspect ratio shear wall. These are tongue twisters. I, that's <laughs> especially C. I'm like, oh my goodness. So, all right, so we've got about 50% of you have voted. I'm going to give you just a few more seconds here. Hopefully we can get to at least 70%. This is a tough one, especially since the poll window kind of takes away that example. So it's hard to see. We apologize for that. Go to webinar kind of that might be something we need to let them know that we could have both things showing would be good. So all right, I'm gonna go ahead and close and share. Um, so 78% said answers A and C, so that it has a has lower strength than a low aspect ratio sh shear wall and anchorage slip may contribute considerably to wall deflection, while 12% said all of the above and then just a smattering of the other answers. So, Michelle, I'm going to have you tell us what the real answer is. There we go. Are you back? Did we lose Michelle? Okay. There we go. Sorry. I had to clear my... Th anyway. Um, <laughs> So we're talking about high aspect ratio shear walls. Now, the high aspect ratios, because of their aspect ratios, they do have a lower strength. And the second one is the high aspect ratio shear walls do not have a lower deflection than a low aspect ratio. In other words, the high aspect ratio deflects more than one that has such as a one to one ratio, low aspect ratio. And then also, the anchorage slip may contribute considerably to the deflection, as we've shown in the three-term equation. And that's especially true for the high aspect ratio shear wall, which is what we're talking about. And just as an example, I should go back to here, you can see, let me go back to here, go back, just to prove the point about the, uh, the elongation of that anchorage in high aspect ratio, you can see that the bending and the shear don't contribute nearly as much as that anchorage slip 
So when we're choosing anchors for our shear walls and we're trying to reduce our deflection on our shear walls, this is an area where we can adjust the deflection of our shear wall by providing one that doesn't have as much elongation. And this applies to the narrow walls, high aspect ratio shear walls. Okay, now after that poll, it's great that most of the audience got that one correct, answer A and C. Okay, so the previous design example, we went through and did the general approach of deflection calculation approach. Now this second design example is going to look at the alternate approach, the adjustment by our familiar reduction of 2B over H. Same configuration, and we have the shear wall on the left, which is shear wall 1, uh, 8 to 8, I mean 1 to 1 ratio, and then the shear wall on the right, which is shear wall 2, which has an aspect ratio of 3.5. So shear wall 1, we know we got our nominal shear, unit shear capacities of 520 pounds per linear foot. We receive that from the table. And then our aspect ratio is 8 over 8, which is 1. And then we've got to adjust that, looking at that, because we're doing the alternate method, using the adjustment factor based on stiffness, which is 2B over H, and that equals 1. And then we also look at our strength reduction, which also is a reduction because we're less than 2 to 1, remember we have an aspect ratio of 1 to 1, and our uh, aspect ratio factor is 1. Now this is where they are not cumulative. Because we are adjusting it, taking the alternate approach, we're adjusting it here for the strength because of the stiffness, and then here for the aspect ratio. So we take the smaller of the two, and in this case they're both equal. So it doesn't matter here, but in the next one, we'll, the next shear wall, we'll show you where you would take the smaller of the two. So taking our unit shear capacity of four seismic of 520 pounds per linear foot, that's our nominal unit shear, and dividing by two to get it into an allowable stress design. Then we multiply it by 1.0 and that gives us our capacity of 261, uh, 260 pounds per linear foot. Now looking at shear wall 2, what we would see is that, again, we take the 520 pounds per linear foot from the table. Our aspect ratio is 8 over 2.3, which gives us an aspect ratio of 3.5 to 1. And then our aspect ratio adjustment, again, based on 2B over H, is 0.57. And this is to adjust it for the stiffness of the shear wall. We also look at our aspect ratio factor for strength, and that is 0.81 from the equation. Uh, I don't remember what the, ex but it's the uh, equation from 4.3.4.2. Now we compare the two because they're not cumulative and what we find is for the narrow shear wall distributing in the same line is the one to adjust for stiffness governs. So we take that and we plug it into the equation. We have our unit shear capacity uh, from the nominal unit shear capacity of 520 divided by 2 to get it into an allowable stress design. And then to adjust it for the stiffness is 0.57, coming up with 148 pounds per linear foot. Um, compared to what we did in the previous example where we just did the deflection calculation approach, which is 141 pounds per linear foot. So they're close, but not exact. And then our capacity is, what we see is 260 pounds per linear foot times 8, which gives us a capacity of 2,080, which is what we had previously, and then 148 pounds per linear foot times 2.3, which is 340 pounds, giving us a total of 2,420 pounds per 
of capacity for our shear wall. So that was a really quick way to coming up with the capacities using this alternate approach, the adjustment factor approach. And you note that uh, this capacity is compared to what we did in example one of 2,402. <clears throat> and let's go to the next one. Let me just go, before we get into that, I want to do one more thing. And that's based on the adjustment method. I just wanted to do one more thing. Okay. I just want to do. So we have now a poll to go over. Okay. Ready? Mm-hmm. Okay. So the simplified approach allows distribution of force to align based on segment lengths. So this is just a simple true or false, um, and people are quickly voting, so that's good. Um, got about a 50% vote now, so I'm going to give what? it about, oh, sorry. I Go was going to say, I was going to explain this question. Go what ahead. this is stating is, is that you're distributing the load just based on the lengths of the segments. So in other words, if you had 1,000 pounds, you would distribute it based on 1,000 divided by 8 plus 2, 1,000 divided by 10. Is this true or false? All right, so I've got about 75% have voted, and we've spent about a minute, so I'm going to go ahead and close. And let's see, so 71% say it's true and 29% say false. So, Michelle, the real answer is? I'm sorry, what did you say? How many said? I'm sorry, 71% true and 29% false. Okay, and the real answer is false. So, that means that, hmm, that's interesting. So, when we... The previous, what we need to do is look at what we're trying to do. So when we distribute the load to a line of shear walls, such as the 8 foot and the 2.3, we take the load and we distribute it based on the stiffness of the walls. When we take in the stiffness of the walls, we need to take into account the overall, what's the constructed, the wall is constructed on, what the height of the wall is, what the aspect ratio is, and distribute it. We can't just distribute it based on the length of the wall. Okay, hopefully that clarifies that. Now, there are tools available that are out in the industry, and one of them is a software Woodworks Design Office, which this is showing results for. And it, what it does is you're able to pretty quickly come up with a solution based on the two different approaches. One is the equal deflection approach, which is shown here. Let me go here and go forward, which is shown here. So the equal deflection approach. And we have, it has a similar layout of the shear walls. This is eight foot to eight foot, so eight foot high to eight foot length. And then we have a second shear wall that is eight foot height. And this actual design example has a 2.313 length. Our example had a 2.3 length, but it comes up with similar results. So the aspect ratio is one for the eight foot Eight, 8 to 8 shear wall, and then the aspect ratio is 3.4, where we, as, we had a uh, 3.5 aspect ratio. And then on the NX slide, what it shows is, is the software will do an iterative solution to distribute the loads to each of the segments. As you recall, our capacity for our 8-foot wall was 260 pounds per linear foot. And then our wall for the narrower wall was actually, in this results, came up with 214 pounds per linear foot. 
but because of some rounding and then using different lengths, ours was actually 204, I mean 210 pounds per linear foot, so it's pretty close to what they got in their software solution, which is 214 pounds per linear foot. And again, the reduction here is 0.82 here shown, whereas we had 0.81. Eight, one. So very close to what we came up with with the hand solution, hand calculation. And uh, the adjustment for the capacity exception where we're looking at the, instead of going the deflection capacity approach, they're using the adjustment factor approach. They came up with a, uh, again, same configurations came up with 0.43, and then 0.58 was the final adjustment using the, the adjustment factor approach. And then we'll look at this slide here. So 260 pounds, that did not change. Taking into account the high aspect ratio and adjusting it for that actual adjustment factor, they came up with 152 pounds per linear foot and we came up with 100 and uh, let's see 48 pounds per linear foot a little bit of rounding there also and given different lengths of the shear wall now the other information um, interesting aspect about this software is it also checks for ASC storage drift using strength level forces so that's another check that's built into the actual software. We, we didn't show the results here though because we were only concentrating on distributing the, the loads to the shear walls based on the deflection calculation approach. Um, this shows you some of the input for the software and just blowing that up a little bit more. You, there are distribution choices using either the equal deflection approach and the capacity exception. Showing, and then you can also have using three-term equation or a four-term equation, et cetera, et cetera, and different types of uh, shear walls also, and whether or not there is any contribution from different uh, other uh, non-wood panels on the other side. <clears throat> so a handy software, and um, I did mention the three-term versus the four-term option. So this ends our actual webinar uh, ends the official concludes the American Institute of Architects continuing education course and we do have some questions but I wanted to mention one the software that we were talking about is the woodwork software it's uh, been updated to the 2015 NDS wind and seismic provisions and the IBC 2015 as well as ASCE 710 it's compliant. Um, there's um, released in November of 2016 so using uh, some standalone versions as well as uh, using gravity design, lateral design, fasteners, etc. And for those of you that are members of AWC, you do get a 10% discount for this software. So you can contact Woodworks to uh, to find out more information and there's the web link. So Marcy, I'm going to bring you back to make an announcement. All right, here we go. I've just got some real quick, more a uh, little bit more information for you. Our partner organization, Woodworks, provides wood project assistance and other resources. If you want to reach out to them, email help at woodworks.org or visit their website at woodworks.org project assistance. You can also request assistance from them on our survey that you'll be getting in the email after today's webinar. Um, Let's see. Also, in order to help design professionals stay informed about technical issues affecting the wood industry, we offer a design professional membership. Check out um, our website if you're interested in that. We also have a special program for code officials called Code Official Connections Benefits. Um, check out our website for that as well.
And then just a reminder, um, as I said before the program, give us about a half an hour to run reports and then keep an eye out for an email from us. Um, complete the survey for a chance to win a free publication. Check out information about your certificate of completion and CEUs. Note that the actual certificates won't be immediately available. They'll be available within two weeks from today. Remember that in order to receive credit, you must have been present for 90% of this one hour webinar. That's 54 minutes and you must have an account with us. Um, please join us again in January for our seismic shear wall uh, design examples for 2015 WFCM and 2015 SpidWiz webinar and tell your friends to join us. Also available is our e-learning program which you can find in the education section of our webpage and if you want to book a live presentation just contact us. Um, any other questions or want more information, email us at education at awc.org. And that's all I've got. Thank you once again for your attention and have a happy holiday. Now back to Michelle for some questions and answers. Great. Yes. Thank, thank you, Marcy. Thank you, Marcy. And well done, Michelle. I've got a couple questions. Well, actually, there's a ton of questions that came in, but we're only going to have time for a few here. So if you want to stick around uh, for a little Q&A, that's fine. If you have to drop off and you've been here for at least 54 minutes, um, that's fine, too. The recording will be available um, in, on our website in uh, a, a week or so. But uh, first question, Michelle, uh, as you were talking about the deflection equation, the delta sub A, the elongation uh, for the, the hold downs, uh, where do those values come from? Is there a generic table somewhere? Uh, could you talk about that a little bit more? Sure. So that's talking about the third part of the equation in the deflection equation, the three-term equation, and the elongation factor, delta sub A, uh, comes from the manufacturer. So whatever literature the, or whoever, whatever manufacturer you're using for your hold downs, you would co contact them to get that information. And a lot of times, a lot of the manufacturers have it right in their publications for their hardware. Okay. Great. Um, also a question about stapled shear walls. Uh, we don't have that in the wind and seismic standard. Where would they get information about staples and stapled shear walls? Uh, I believe you're talking about capacities. Uh, yeah. Is that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So for someone using stapled shear walls, you would go to one, the IBC, or a code evaluation report, um, and then such as ISANTA, ESR 15, I think it's 39, yeah, 1539, yep. okay. to get more information on staples. Great. Another question came in about whether or not this approach we talked about applies to perforated shear walls. And um, the deflection uh, calculation approach does not apply to perforated shear walls. It only applies to the segmental shear walls. I believe that's the approach that, they're talking about. Yeah, that's correct. There is a, a and, step. Okay. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Well, there's a separate approach uh, in uh, the wind and seismic standard for. 0.3.4.3 that's specific to the perforated oh. shear wall segments. Correct. And uh, yeah, and I saw that question there right at the end that came in. How do you handle openings in shear walls? Um, that would be with that perforated shear wall approach. You could still use the segmented approach, obviously, and just put hold downs around each of the segments, but uh, right. perforated shear wall approach is is pretty specific. All right, well, I think that's um, going to wrap it up for us today. Um, I know that with all the other questions that came in, uh, our help desk will be looking at those and, and responding to folks that had other questions. We tried to respond to some of them along the way as well. So Michelle, why don't you go ahead and close us out? Great. Right. Thank you very much. And we hope that you will join us in the future for our other webinars throughout the year. We're already planning for next year. And please respond to the survey that will be sent out later on, I believe this afternoon. And we look forward to your feedback. Thank you again.